We've come to the time where you are going to learn more about Dr. Dina Tapscott. And I uh, listen, I'm telling you, she's coming with a well of knowledge, but not just book knowledge, also experiential knowledge. So she'll speak from that being a cancer survivor herself, but her bio is extensive. So it will take a greater portion of the morning to give it all to you. So I'm just gonna give you some highlights. I wanna share with you her specialty. She specializes in functional medicine, adult holistic primary care and obesity medicine and she's board certified in internal medicine. And I just like her overall practicing philosophy. Find the root cause. It's not enough to diagnose a disease or treat a symptom without delving deeper and appreciating the processes that underlie the condition. And I'm sure she's gonna speak more about that, but I just think that is awesome. And so just a little bit more about Dr. Tapscott. She's been practicing medicine for over 18 years. As a member of the Obesity Medical Medicine Association, she received formal training and medical treatment of obesity and has spent the last 13 years helping thousands of DC area residents reduce their disease burden, amazing, resulting in healthier lives. By implementing a holistic approach to weight loss, she incorporated the latest science, pharmacology, nutrition, and behavioral health into her practice. She's also a diplomat of the American Board of Obesity Medicine and has developed and directed several hospital-affiliated medical and surgical weight loss programs. She's also taught at HU for all my Howard University people. And I would be remiss if I didn't say she's also a wife and a mother of two boys. So with no further ado, I introduce you to Dr. Tapscott. Dr. Tapscott, take it away. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you for um, allowing me to talk to you today. I hope the technology is working out, but somebody will let me know if you can't hear me too well. Um, I also want to thank you guys for the last several months for washing your hands, social distancing, and wearing masks. I know it hasn't been easy for all of us. Um, and, you know, as it seems today, COVID-19 is not going away in no time soon, at least. So today we're going to change gears a little bit and focus our attention on how we can prepare ourselves for actually being exposed to the virus. And this is, shouldn't be taboo. We know it's out there. Um, so that, you know, if you are exposed, you end up being the person who doesn't know because you don't have any symptoms or your symptoms are real mild. But the interventions that we're gonna discuss today go well beyond the pandemic. And so if you start to implement many of these, they'll actually help decrease many chronic health conditions. As you see the, the talk, is broken up into sort of three parts. I'll talk to you a little bit about functional medicine because that's the approach that we're gonna take. Um, I won't get too geeky into the immune system, but I do wanna give you a little bit of background and then we'll really focus our attention on what we can do. The question was, have, um, have you or anyone you've known been exposed? So number two is, has this, your stress level increased during this? And, <laughs> I would expect it's up 71%. So definitely um, we'll wanna intervene and talk about stress. Um, the other two questions, let's see, the third question is the past few months, have you had trouble sleeping? Actually, um, let's see, most people say some of the time and we'll talk about sleep because it's important for your immune health. And then, wow, number four says, you know, do you take supplements daily? So I'm excited, 80%, 83% of you are already taking supplements. Wonderful. Um, hopefully we'll get you on the right track. All right, so let's move on. Um, in 2014, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I didn't know why. I didn't have any risk factors, at least that I was aware of. I was pretty healthy. Um, but in trying to you know, figure out what was going on, I mean, I went through conventional therapy. I had surgery and, and chemotherapy, hence bald head. Um, 
And, you know, but I was still questioning why, like, it didn't make sense how, you know, why I got breast cancer. And, and during my quest, I realized, um, it kind of led me to functional medicine. It led me to asking or understanding my own health. Um, and so when you look at the next slide, you'll see, so this is a way to think about um, functional medicine versus conventional medicine. So using a tree to illustrate this, um, think about the top of the tree, which is what you're used to. Like you have your heart doctor and your kidney doctor, you have your lung doctor, you have your endocrinologist, you know, you have these different doctors that treat different organs. But, you know, my question to you is who's the human body doctor? Who's taking care of everything? Who's connecting all the dots? Um, and, you know, instead of treating symptoms, like when you go to your doctor's office, uh, functional medicine actually asks the questions, you know, why do you have this problem to begin with? Um, we look at the root cause of the illness and the approaches that we take, although we use medications, the approaches that we take um, are, are natural and we're really focused on lifestyle and diet to, um, to take care of our patients. And so going back to my story, the three things that I sort of learned through this functional medicine approach as to why I got breast cancer, number one, you know, I had a problem with detoxifying estrogen. And these are tests that were advanced tests. They weren't done in conventional medicine, but I realized I didn't process it properly. I had a problem with my gut microbiome. And um, we'll learn more about what that really is because it's really your immune health. And so my microbiome, my immune system wasn't handling the cancer cells. It wasn't putting them in check. And then stress, which is definitely, um, we're all dealing with it, but stress, I was working at Howard at the time and it really did kind of um, blend into everything that was going on um, contributing to you know, my illness. All right. so. Um, you know, we've, you guys have, we all have been living with this virus, you know, for several months now. I want to take a different look at it to have you see how it infects the body um, and gets into the organs. And this is going to better help us as we talk about the interventions that we're going to use to handle the virus. So there's a short video. We can start the video and... Um, An individual ahead. virus particle, or virion, is invisible to our naked eye. It takes roughly a thousand coronavirus particles to span the width of a human hair. It travels lightly. A virus is just genetic material wrapped in a layer of protein and fat. <coughs> Spreading through the air in moisture droplets or on surfaces. Finding its way into our eyes noses and mouths. Inside, the coronavirus hijacks the cells in the back of our nose, replicating and spreading downward, infecting healthy cells along the way. Some viruses, like the ones that cause the common cold, infect our nose and throat. Others can cause viral pneumonia. That usually infects smaller areas of just one lung. The coronavirus packs a vicious double punch. It can infect the entire respiratory system, all the way down to millions of tiny air sacs called alveoli. Here is a single healthy alveolus. Right next to it, there's a thin blood vessel, a capillary. This is where one of our most life-sustaining exchanges happens. The alveolus brings oxygen into the bloodstream and excretes carbon dioxide. But the virus disrupts this whole process. This immune cell, a macrophage, attacks it. Sometimes it defeats the virus. If our body needs more help, it recruits more immune cells, like these neutrophils. While they're attacking the virus, they can end up injuring the alveolus too, breaking down its walls. Fluid rushes from the blood vessels into the alveolus, filling it up and blocking the exchange of oxygen. Now it's much harder to breathe. 
It's ultimately this two-pronged attack that makes the coronavirus so deadly. The attack from the virus and our immune system's explosive response. All this can lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome, what most people with COVID-19 die from. Okay, um, and we'll get back to how that applies when we start talking about interventions. But I wanna move on to looking at, um, you know, one thing that's disturbing um, that we're hearing about is the higher death rates um, in our community. And a lot of this in terms of COVID-19 and when you compare it to, um, to Caucasians, and so we're represented in orange. And a lot of it has to do with our comorbidities, you know, diabetes and other cardiovascular disease. And we thought it was going to be a lung issue. We thought that those who had lung problems was going to have more of a, a higher risk, but we come to find out it's actually those with more cardiovascular risk, which is in higher prevalence in our community. But fortunately, a lot of what we'll discuss today actually, although it's relating to the immune system, it can be applied to your overall health and actually lower risk um, of, of many chronic health conditions. So in back in the beginning of this, um, you know, even before it really hit the United States, um, our office was um, sort of paying attention to what was going on throughout the world globally. And I put together this flyer. Um, I was trying to give it out to patients and family and friends to get started on people's immune system. We didn't, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of information about COVID, but we knew a lot about viruses and colds. And we definitely knew a lot about the immune system, especially in, the, in our functional medicine space. And all over this time, we've learned a lot um, about the virus and how it acts. But as you know, we still don't have a specific treatment. Um, although we're using certain things in the hospital, we really don't have a treatment and we also don't have a, a vaccine. But what we do have are ways that you can intervene to actually support your immune health, as we talked about. And so there's really three things we're going to focus on today. What are you eating? How are you living your life? And then where can we intervene in terms of vitamins and supplements and, and herbs? So let's start with the question. Um, as we move into the next topic, I want you to be thinking about like grandma's recipe for a cold. All right. So when you think about when you were younger and you got sick, what did somebody do? What did somebody recommend? Things like bone broth, right? And we actually know that bone broth supports your immune health. Um, what about teas, different types of tea? And we'll talk a little bit about cystic tea. But um, also gargling with warm salt water. I mean, these seems tri seem trivial, but you saw in the video how the virus gets in. So if we can help protect the mucosa, the eyes, the nose, the throat, we can actually decrease the likelihood that this virus is going to attach. Other things to think about, um, you want to think about grandma's recipes. Um, I want you to be thinking about using like humidifiers or vaporizers. Uh, these are things that, um, that, you know, I usually tell my patients, if you go outside and you're around people, like let's say you're just, you go to a restaurant and you're social distancing, but you're still at a restaurant, you know there's people around. When you come home, boil some water, put it in a pan, put your face down with a towel around it, throw in some eucalyptus oil or peppermint or frankincense, not a lot, and then just breathe it in. Because once again, what are we doing? We're sort of helping the mucosa. It seems simple. Um, and I don't know why it's not being talked about, um, you know, but these are basic things that you can do. Also, if you have sinus issues or allergies, if this is your season, make sure you're using sinus irrigation um, just to, to help make sure you're uh, clearing out the nose as well. All right, well, what about food? Uh, we know we're supposed to eat healthy, right? We, but if you ever ask yourself, like, why do I have to eat these vegetables? What's the benefit to my body? And we're going to talk about that. Um, Thinking about, you know, how, why we eat and how that affects um, viral infections. There's sort of three mechanisms that we're focusing on. One is gonna be lowering inflammation. 
So we're gonna eat foods that make sure that they lower inflammation. Um, inflammation is the underlying cause of every chronic disease. If you tell me you have cancer or heart disease or diabetes or obesity, I'll tell you that inflammation is the root cause. So a lot of what we eat actually addresses inflammation. Oxidative stress is like the wear and tear that the body goes through as you get older or as um, if you have health conditions. And so we wanna make sure we decrease that oxidative stress using um, high antioxidants. And then getting back to that gut microbiome, making sure you have a healthy gut microbiome because the microbiome is sort of, this is the bacteria and the viruses. These are the, the things that support our immune health. Actually 90% or 80-90% of our immune system is in our gut. So we really wanna support that. Um, but it's, it's, you may be asking the question like why, you know, how do I have, how do I know if I have high inflammation or oxidative stress or gut issues? And it's important that you actually, you know, talk to your doctor about, well, can you test me for this? Because there are tests that can be done and there are also advanced tests that can be done that can really look at answering these questions for you. All right, so what about, what do you eat, right? Um, there's a lot of diets out there and I know we get confused but just to keep it simple, this is what I tell my patients. I want you to think about like how your grandmother, great grandmother ate, right? She didn't eat out of a box, a bag or a can. She ate what came from the ground or what grew on the ground. And she ate what roamed the earth, right? So the animals. And if you can really kind of think about eating pretty basic like that, you know, clean eating, it'll go a long way when you're trying to figure out, well, what am I supposed to eat? All right, so with that in mind, um, you know, think about a food that you ate yesterday that had a certain color. So think about what you ate that was red, one something that was purple, and then something that was yellow as we move on. So eating the colors of the rainbow, that's what we're talking about. So another way to think about this, and I recommend you do this with your kids, it's, it's um, especially if they're really young and, and haven't started eating a lot of sugar yet, you know, start talking about, well, what colors did you eat? Because these different colors, so you want to get at least one or two food items from each color group every day. Um, but these colors actually provide specific types of nutrients. So it's important. So think about eating the colors of the rainbow to help support inflammation. All right, well, what should you not eat? Um, sugar is the enemy. It has always been the enemy. Fat is not the enemy. Um, sugar is very inflammatory as it relates to the immune system. It actually can affect those macrophages, the ones that we, I showed you in the video that are actually killing the virus. It can, it can adversely affect them so they're not working as well. There's a lot of sugar. It's in foods that we eat. It's in foods that you may think are healthy. Like, you know, if you're going to Starbucks and you simply are, you know, getting your Frappa, Kappa, you know, those things have a lot of sugar in it. They're not like black coffee. Um, also, a lot of condiments have sugars in it. So just be thinking about where is this sugar, because managing blood sugar is going to be important. As you saw, uh, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, all of that is related to sugar. Um, I won't go into detail, but I want you guys to be thinking about how you can incorporate intermittent fasting. That's a big part of lowering sugar and supporting your immune system as well. All right, well, what can you eat? Um, there's a lot of foods. And um, one thing about citrus food, foods um, is it actually decreases the virus from getting into the cell. It supports your immune health and it decreases blood clotting. And the reason why that's important is because um, in this infection, there's a higher risk of clotting, which is why people get strokes and other cardiovascular problems. So really getting a lot of citrus fruits and foods into your diet actually support that as well. There are foods um, in addition to the citrus fruits, like um, foods that we call bitters, right? So you'll see things like um, endive and dandelion and arugula. These are actual foods that support detoxification. And so liver and gut health. Um, we hear a lot about detoxifying and we're trying to, we're always using these you know, lo use lotions and potions and these herbs, but really, if you just really focus on food, especially all these phytonutrients, that's really what's going to support your body's ability to detoxify. All right, 
Um, moving on, let's talk about some spices. I want you to think about what you've had in your cabinet, like what you already have that you may have used over the last, let's say, few days in, in making a dish. And the reason why it's important, because these spices and herbs are what you can use to, um, to support this, this oxidative stress that we talked about. There are a lot of antioxidant rich foods um, and they can be used for other things. For example, cinnamon, um, as many of you may know, is a great appetite suppressant. So throw it in your coffee in the morning. Ginger is good for digestion. Um, oregano we use as an antifungal, has some antifungal properties. Um, also think like nuts and seeds um, have are high antioxidant foods. Um, chocolate is good, but the caveat to chocolate, hold on, is it's got to be um, dark chocolate, which is bitter, and it should be about 70% cacao. So we're not talking Kit Kats and Hershey bars. Um, and then also how you cook your food is important, right? So you know, the, the grilling and the frying may taste really good, but you have to be careful because that, if you do too much of that, that actually changes the chemical composition of the food and it makes it more pro-inflammatory. Okay, so we're gonna take a, a minute just to look at this really short video talking about what I alluded to in the beginning. Let's go into what the microbiome is. It's in you, it's all over you. It is you. Your body consists of an entire ecosystem of diverse and helpful little bacteria. More than 100 trillion of them. This is the human microbiome, and it means that we each have a troop of good bacterial superheroes to call our own. Did you know that the greatest concentration of bacterial superheroes lives in your gut? This ecosystem of microorganisms is a huge part of who you are. Your microbiome aids in food digestion to fuel your body, influences your mood and energy levels, helps you adapt to your surroundings to protect against harmful organisms, and much, much more. Scientists have only just scratched the surface of understanding how incredible these little guys truly are and how important they are to our health. It all started when you were born. Some of the bacteria in your mother's microbiome were passed along to you to become the beginnings of your very own microbiome fingerprint. When you were a baby, experiencing the world for the first time, the bacteria in your microbiome were doing the same. By the time you were a toddler, the makeup of your gut microbiome was almost fully matured. At two or three years of age, your bacterial superheroes had already established a natural, balanced state. Did you know that diversity is the key to a healthy microbiome? In a forest with only one kind of tree, what would happen if a beast came along and ate up all the leaves? All the creatures in the forest would be affected. In the same way, diversity is also needed in the bacteria of your gut. Scientists have discovered that your microbiome fingerprint actually needs to consist of many different types of bacteria to keep you strong, healthy, and resilient to drastic or harmful changes. Did you know that a healthy microbiome likes balance? When your microbiome becomes unbalanced, you may become unhealthy and even susceptible to chronic disease. But with the help of your superheroes, your microbiome always strives to return to a natural, balanced state. Eating pre and probiotics can help your superheroes to be more effective in keeping you healthy. Your microbiome plays a starring role when it comes to this. From digesting food, to affecting mood and energy levels, to preventing invasions by bad microorganisms, your superheroes are working hard to keep your gut healthy every minute of every day. Okay, so um, the only thing I would take away from that video is the bread, which I'm not a big fan of, but there are definitely foods that she mentioned in the video that are prebiotic. These are foods that have the good bacteria and then probiotics are actually foods that contain um, the good bacteria. So prebiotics feed the bacteria and probiotics actually have it. And um, don't worry about writing all this stuff down. Just so you know, this, these, uh, this slide deck is going to be available to you guys. All right. Um, let's start talking about lifestyle interventions. And we're going to go into things like stress and sleep, physical activity, and then our connections. Many of these things we talked about in the poll I see that there were some, some sleep issues, but definitely some stress going on. So we'll talk about that. 
Let's start with what makes you laugh. I just want you to be thinking about some things, some people who make you laugh. Um, laughter, you know, it really is the best medicine. And unfortunately, um, if you turn on the news, you know, there are three main topics that are, you know, that aren't so funny. Um, you know, we're dealing with this horrible pandemic, which is putting a burden on us medically, our health, as well as our economic system. Um, we're dealing with the racial in injustices that are out there in our community. And then, you know, we're dealing with this political climate and the buffoonery in the White House. So, you know, the, the challenge is we've got to turn off the TV and start calling up friends who can make us laugh because it is a way to manage our stress. And I think it's an important way to manage our stress. There are other things. Um, and, you know, I think it's important, especially with this community that we continue to pray. Um, it may not be the way we were doing it before where you actually went to church, um, but I know through technology, there are ways to, you know, continue this um, prayer because what we know when it comes to prayer um, is similar to what we know when it comes to meditation. And we have more research related to meditation, but the physiology is the same when you're praying or you're meditating. And therefore, um, the benefits are the same. So really, it improves your sleep. Um, it definitely works to support your immune system, which is what we're talking about. Um, it manages stress. It lowers that inflammation I keep talking about. And then as we get older, it will also improve our um, memory and cognition. I know you guys have talked about this um, and you had a wonderful webinar. So I won't go into as much detail, but definitely prayer and meditation are going to be things to incorporate when you're dealing with stress. Other things that you can do, music, um, all types of music, whatever you're liking. Um, and then magnesium, we call magnesium the uh, nature's chill pill. Uh, magnesium will help with blood pressure. Um, we know that it helps with anxiety and sleep. Um, it actually helps with wrinkles. Um, magnesium can come in, in foods. It also can come in, like if you do Epsom salt soaks, that's where you're, you're actually bringing in magnesium through your skin. Um, and, and then of course, you know, different supplements and then, um, essential oils. Um, I'm a big fan of essential oils. Um, they're beneficial. I use them with my kids. Um, you know, you can, I, I usually tell people get a diffuser and just put it by your workstation. Now you guys are home, a lot of us, so you don't have to work, worry about what, you know, what your neighbor in the next cubicle is, is allergic to. Just have your essential oils in front of you um, in a diffuser. You can use things for sleep, for stress management. Um, and also, as I mentioned in the beginning, there are other types of um, oils that you can use in the, when you're using the steaming. All right. Um, you know, there's a lot of information out there, and I'm hoping that this talk does not add to that burden, but information overload is another thing to consider and, and really trying to turn things off because there's just a lot out there and that can definitely increase stress. All right. So how many hours are you actually getting sleep? Now, if you have a child, an infant, um, or you're taking care of a grandchild, there, there may be some interruptions, but hopefully you guys are getting in, you know, the eight hours, at least eight hours of uninterrupted sleep because sleep is critical. We don't pay as much attention to it. We think it's, you know, I've got work to do. I don't, I, I'll sacrifice sleep, but there's a lot of research to support how sleep is benefiting us um, on many levels. Um, so, you know, one of the things as it relates to the immune system and sleep is that it actually during sleep, you produce these cytokines or these proteins that help with inflammation or lowering inflammation. We also know that um, with sleep, um, there's something called the glymphatic system. This is the sort of like the lymphatic system, but it's of the brain and it's the body's way to sort of release or remove the toxins of, you know, that occurred during the actual day. So you got to think about your sleep ritual, like what happens, um, you know, not turning on the news too late at night or getting into arguments or paying bills because you want to get your body, you know, ready to sleep. You want to limit the caffeine and then alcohol. A lot of people use alcohol to help them sleep. Um, but unfortunately, it actually disrupts your, your 
the quality of your sleep. Um, if you're on the computers at night, you want to be thinking about blue light blocking glasses. Um, this helps decrease um, the, it actually increases your melatonin, which is helpful for sleep and other things that we'll talk about, but it also lowers cortisol. Um, for those of us who um, are not fond of heat and are, you know, dealing with our own hormonal imbalances, there's things that are like the chili pad, which is, um, it's sort of the biohacking technique that you can use. It's like a mattress you can put on your side of the bed um, and it can help regulate your heat. Um, you can also th use things like the aura ring. It's another type of biohacking device um, that allows you to monitor your sleep patterns. And some people do need things like melatonin or the magnesium that I mentioned or using essential oils, or you may even th use things like lemon balm or passion flower. These are types of teas. One thing I want you to be aware of is going to be what's going on with the electromagnetic fields or EMFs. Um, this is something with 5G that we, we just have to be more aware of, and I won't go into details, but just remember we are, you know, you're at home and your kids potentially are on electronics, you and your husband are on electronics, or if you're in an apartment building, there's all these, this Wi-Fi going on. And so you want to be, you know, trying to minimize this. If nothing else, turn your phone to airplane mode at night when you're not using it, put the phone away from you. Um, because these do, research is showing that there's some damage that can happen from the immune system when it comes to all of this Wi-Fi that we're dealing with. All right. Um, with physical activity, I know you guys have been doing it during the challenge, so I'm not going to go into much detail other than to say um, if you are infected, but you're feeling good, it's okay to be active. The problem is we don't want you doing high intensity workouts. You know, for those that are really athletic, you'll catch a cold and not even thinking about it and keep going. But what we know is that high intensity workouts can actually cause more inflammation. So just take it down a notch, um, but you can get back to it. Social connections are also really important, especially um, where we are now. And um, it's important to be thinking about um, how you can still interact, being around people who are positive. Um, and then the lowering inflammation is what we find when there are social connections. We also know that um, when you look at aging um, and those in people in the blue zones, um, being around others in a community is uh, one of the factors that increases longevity. Now, I know this was, um, you know, this was what you were doing to socially connect when you were pre-COVID. And I know we're going to get back to this, um, but for now, you know, things are different. And once again, using technology through like Zooms, you can, you know, still interact. Being mindful of the older population, um, your, your family members, making sure you're connecting with them. It's going to be important because um, there is more social isolation in that community. All right. So we're moving on um, now to uh, the topic which most people are interested in and, and I'm always getting questions about, well, okay, well, what do I take? Um, and I'll, I'll preface this um, discussion by saying that um, I don't, you know, I'm not affiliated with any particular nutraceutical company. Um, I do recommend different uh, medical grade supplements to my family and friends and, um, and of course patients. Um, but even though these products are natural, um, it's still important to look at drug interactions um, and they have side effects. Um, so, you know, discuss these things with your doctor. All right. Um, you know, I've been talking to different churches about this topic and I, I talked to one church group where everyone was pretty much over the age of 65. And so they were already on a bunch of pills. I'm hoping that you guys aren't, but I know that you know some of you are taking pills, but I don't want you to think of vitamins, herbs as being pills. I'd rather you think of them as being like food because the problem is um, the food of today is not the food that I grew up with or that you grew up with. You know, the broccoli from today does not have the same nutrients that it did 
you know, when I was growing up, when we were growing up, when the past, because the soil is different. Also, as we get older, we don't digest as well. Our digestive enzymes actually decline, so we don't absorb the nutrients as well. Um, and so it is important that, you know, you, before you just start taking anything, to really know what deficiencies you have. So talking to your doctor about, well, which, which, where are my, where are my deficiencies? Do I have vitamin D, which most of us do? Do I have, um, uh, magnesium deficiencies. So getting tested um, is going to be important because these herbs are going to be designed to help support your immune system, decrease the viral growth. And, and we even use these um, as we address some of the symptoms that happen with the infection itself. All right. Um, I talked to you in the beginning about sort of making sure that the sinuses and the nose is clear. We call it keeping the portal clean because this is, once again, this is where the virus is going to get in and attach. And there are certain um, herbal teas like cystus tea I mentioned, or things like propolis, which are, can be for, in the form of sprays. And these actually help keep the viral load down because um, what it does is it prevents the virus from attaching to the cell. It also modulates the immune system. Um, and um, we find that, for example, if you look at the, the um, beehive, that's similar to the alveoli. And so with propolis, it actually keeps these alveoli, alveoli open. So it helps support um, the lungs, which of course is the concern we have with the infection um, of COVID. All right, I just put this slide in here just so you have it as a reference um, and please share it with your doctors. Um, I think this, this is the, one of the articles that really has great references about what we're gonna talk about next, which is related to the, um, the specific supplements. So I want you to think about these supplements in four big categories. The first is gonna be sort of foundational supplements. Um, these are things like your vitamins and minerals and some um, and, and fish oils. Then there are antioxidants, and we talked about antioxidant-based foods. There are also anti-inflammatory, which we talked about different anti-inflammatory mechanisms and lifestyle changes. And then finally, there's immune regulatory, which um, we'll go into in just a minute. This slide also came from the article that I mentioned. Um, it's busy, so I don't want you to necessarily look at all the details, but on the left-hand side, you'll see some of the specifics in terms of dosing. But I want you to pay attention to the top section, which is sort of the progression um, of, in, in some ways, the disease process. Hopefully, most of you are in the preventive stage. You've not been exposed, but by the poll, we know that, that there are uh, at least 50% that either have been exposed or know somebody. Um, and then you may fall into the, I'm exposed, I'm infected. Don't fear. That's the first thing. Don't fear. It doesn't mean you're necessarily going to progress. And that's why we have these interventions, but it may escalate. It may go the, to the next level and how we use these supplements. It sort of depends on where you are on the stage. And then finally there's recovery. So let's look at the first um, foundational supplements. These are things that you probably already know about and hopefully you're already taking. And I will put myself out there and say, please, everybody, just start taking vitamin D. Um, you know, there are different doses, but you can get your blood work. But even if before you get your blood work done, just start taking vitamin D. The browner you are, the less you're absorbing from the sun. And vitamin D, there's definitely some research as it relates to COVID. But vitamin A and D are considered fat-soluble vitamins, um, so you need to have good digestion. Vitamin C, we actually use IV vitamin C in our office, and I'm, I was really happy to see that a lot of hospitals are starting to use IV vitamin C in some of their COVID patients. Now zinc, um, a lot of people know about like zinc lozenges, but zinc needs to get into the cell. And so you need some help with that. So take zinc with things like um, echinacea or even tonic water to help the zinc get into the cell. I mentioned melatonin before. Um, melatonin is important in that it does help initiate sleep, which is what we know about, but it also has great anti-inflammatory properties. Um, and we think that maybe this is one of the reasons why children don't get as sick with, um, with COVID is because they actually have higher levels of melatonin. Quercetin is found in, um, or we actually use quercetin, it's found in like apples and onions. 
Um, and then fish oils, and I didn't talk about this in the, the previous dietary section, but fish oil, you can get it from things like nuts and seeds and avocados. You can also get it from these fish called the smash fish, and I'll go through it. So smash st fish stands for salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. Okay, so those are, um, they have low mercury and a lot of omegas, threes, um, so it's a good um, option for fish oils. Um, antioxidant support comes from things like N-acetylcysteine, and um, N-acetylcysteine actually helps to break down the mucus. Um, it's another one that decreases the clot formation that we talked about with using citrus fruits or foods. And then glutathione is the body's main antioxidant. We use it IVs a lot in our practice for a lot of different medical problems. If you have any kind of asthma or allergy, definitely you want to be on, taking um, glutathione. It comes in liposomal and other formulations. Um, the immune regulatory, what we mean by immune regulatory um, herbs are those that actually help to activate that macrophage, right? The one that's eating up the virus. It, it helps it become more aggressive at destroying the viruses. And the last section is the anti-inflammatory um, supplements. And these are things like curcumin, which is, um, the spice is turmeric, has curcumin in it. It's the yellow spice. It stains everything. I put it on as much as I can. I put it in my coffee. I put it on my kid's popcorn. So anytime you can get in, if you have any anti-inflammatory or any inflammatory condition, joint pains or the other cardiovascular, you definitely want to be taking curcumin. Bromelain is in the core of um, pineapples and we use a lot for allergies. Resveratrol is um, found in, in the red grape. So a lot of people, you know, this is their justification for using, taking in red wine. Um, and I'm not saying you can't drink it, but, um, but at least you, if you do a red wine, at least you're going to get some good resveratrol from that. So forophane is found in things like cruciferous vegetables and bok choy and cauliflower. Um, and then boswellia is another sort of main anti-inflammatory that we use. All right, this is a busy slide and I don't want to, um, I don't want you to get caught up in all the details, but thinking about like step back and, and sort of think about what do, what do you do next? I've given you a lot of information um, and I want you to use this slide to figure out where you are. Um, starting on the left-hand side, you know, what, what is your medical health status? And once again, I, I implore you to talk to your doctor about um, you know, getting tested and assessing what your true health is. Um, but let's say you're at, you know, baseline um, and you're, you're pretty healthy. You want to start with level one, which is the diet, lifestyle, foundational supplements. If you're around people who are immunocompromised, you may want to add it, actually and, um, add the antioxidants. So that's plus or minus. If you do have any health conditions to include being over the age of 65, just move yourself to the next category, add level one and two, which means you're kind of adding on, uh, on top of the foundational supplements um, and tailoring your diet to fit your health condition. You're going to then add things like um, immune support. Now, if you are found to be positive for COVID, hopefully you're already doing level one. Um, but now you're going to increase your dosing. And you'll see the graph that I showed you before gives you some guidance on how to increase the dosing. Um, you'll also add more potassium in your diet, and that's important because it's depleted with this infection. Um, and then if you move even further to where the symptoms start to get worse, and of course you wanna work with your doctor on this, but they're getting worse, that's when what's happening is that your immune system is not really doing what it's supposed to do. It's not putting things, it's not sort of checking things. And that's where we add more of an anti-inflammatory regimen. So you'll see that in the graph. And then the next phase, of course, is you know, you'll end up in the hospital. Um, and all of this that we're talking about today is, of course, is to prevent you from getting to that phase. Um, I'm not a hospitalist, but there is, um, you know, we're, we are using certain medications now that we didn't have before as we learn about, you know, our, our patients requiring oxygen in the hospital. And then finally, the post-COVID phase, which is the, um, you've been infected, you still want to continue this regimen. 
Um, but what now you're going to focus on is sort of some of the lingering symptoms that can happen. Some of you may already be dealing with this, some of the fatigue and shortness of breath, um, chest pain. Some of these things may linger and there's some supplements that you can add or continue to take um, to support this. All right, coming to the end of the talk, some of the final takeaways. Um, as I've tried to stress to you during the talk, I really want to make sure that you are you know what your true health status is. Get with a functional medicine doctor or even your own primary and ask them to do more testing. Find out where you, where you stand so that you can prepare your body for this possible exposure. Making sure that you're really focusing on what you're eating and not eating, um, addressing lifestyles that we talked about, and then using supplements that your body needs um, or depending on where you are in the stage of um, the disease process.